Used to meet these, dude. That was exhilarating. Yeah. I mean, wow. I, I don't know. Well, I, I there. I think there's a point to this. Uh, Mark, how you doing, man? Pretty good, Eric. Wow, that know? was just woke me up. I just, <laughs> what's going on here? Let's see what Eric got. Holy well, it, cow! We may not see any more of that here pretty soon, but this right. is all stemming out of. Well, you got a hold of the script and. The we last did get a hold of the script. And, was supposed uh, to be something like that. Yeah, that's interesting. There's a page of the script. This is from the third act, the final scene that Baldwin was supposed to do. A lot of people believe it was just him firing, uh, you know, at a point of view shot. Far from it. This was a massive shootout. Uh, him fighting three gunmen, hundreds of rounds of ammo would have been exchanged in this battle here. Uh, the guy leaves the uh, the scene, that's Lucas, and then the three bad guys, which is Wood, Drum, and Miller, uh, bust into that church and find a bloody wounded uh, uh, Baldwin there. And uh, this was a massive shootout that I think blows the doors and walls out of that uh, flimsy church that we saw there. So the entire misnomer that this was just Baldwin shooting a gun uh, at the camera is completely wrong. This was going to be... A, the whole second half of the day with a lot of ammo. Okay, well, a, yeah. a, a lot of <laughs> a lot of blank ammo. Let me put it that way, so I can explain the blank dummy live ammo uh, troika to people who may not understand it even at this point. Yeah, definitely. Um, tell us about it. Okay, so um, just to take a look at a, a regular nine millimeter uh, bullet here. Mm -hmm. um, the top is the projectile, the copper part. Bottom is the uh, shell casing. And with a, a blank, you would not have the projectile on top. You'd have uh, plastic gunpowder beneath it. And the plastic or the foam would be stuffed in or wax, you know, keeping the uh, gunpowder intact. You would not have a projectile on top. With a dummy, now you could use a dummy on camera. So the dummy has a couple of pellets in it has a point like this does on the nine mm -hmm. millimeter has the primer uh, pin primped which this doesn't so there would be an indentation there and you could actually rattle it and hear the the bb inside and these bullets these these dummy bullets which cannot fire are used as actual props to be seen on camera if you're pointing a gun at camera you would see the head of the bullet for instance the 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 projectile part so it's a visual dummy is what they're or they're loading trying. it or, or loading it or putting it, you know, in a man's hand on camera or taking it out of your pocket or whatever you want to do. 
they're designed to uh, be used on camera, and they're called dummies. So you've and got sometimes live... they have a hole in the side too, right? On you, you can punch a hole in the side. Uh, you could crimp it. There's a lot of different ways to do it. But the point of the matter is, there's no gunpowder in there, and it looks like an actual bullet. So it's a prop in a way of a bullet. You know, it's a a, a prop bullet, let's say. Sure. And so there's there's you could buy a box of dummies and use them on set um, for different reasons. Uh, but when you're having a shootout, it's all blanks. It's all explosive blanks. All those scenes that you saw there, not counting the opening 1931, which is Public Enemy with James Cagney. Uh, in that one, they brought in a, a, a machine gun expert to shoot live rounds. They shot live rounds back in the old days. When you're seeing that concrete blowing off next to Cagney in Public Enemy, those are live rounds being shot there. Hollywood used live rounds for many years. Uh, they didn't use squibs until the 1950s. And squibs are also explosive and can cause a lot of damage. Those, well, are, Eric, those Eric are the Nixon. blood packs. Those are electronic blood packs, by the way. That scene from yeah. Bonnie and Clyde had the most squibs ever used in the history of film. Uh, that, that final scene by in Penn's movie there. Yeah, that was an and that's an <laughs> incredible. I remember <laughs> seeing that live in the theater. How insane that was to see that movie made uh, on the screen on a big screen in 1969. I mean, that that was just like, oh, whoa, what's going on here? Wow, you know, Good. and uh, pretty impressive. Faye Dunaway, watch. Warren Beatty, obviously. Oh yeah, it's amazing to amazing, watch absolutely that. amazing. And the shootout in Heat is amazing. The, the obviously say hello to my little friend, the Scarface thing, <laughs> the Goodfellas trunk scene. Uh, all amazing stuff, but we sure. may be seeing the end of that if Alec Baldwin and Alan Dershowitz and the anti-Second Amendment crowd has their way. This film in New Mexico that was uh, uh, already being shot, a film called The Locksmith, immediately. It's got Ving Rhames, um, Ryan Felipe, and Kate Bosworth. They, they switched to rubber guns and supposedly CGI. I don't know including uh, if you look at the deer hunter with De Niro and the, and the uh, Russian roulette scene, I don't know how you could make any of these films using rubber guns and CGI. And I think we may be seeing the end of that, which may have been part of the reasoning behind whoever sabotaged this film. And I say sabotage because that's what Hannah Reed's lawyers are now calling this incident an incident of sabotage. And we have to, it may not be true, but we have to address it as part mm. of the series. Sure. And you also have some legislation that's uh, immediate legislation out of Sacramento. It was almost like it was pre-written by Dave Cortese up there, uh, banning blank, uh, live rounds and live ammunition, real guns from the set. Obviously, live ammunition is not necessary, uh, but blank ammunition he's also referring to if you read the legislation and well, real if you're saying banning real guns i mean oh yeah yeah no no you're not gonna put a blank in you're not gonna put a blank in a wooden absolutely, gun absolutely absolutely it's, it's a complete yeah. ban on 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 gun uh, shootouts now the reason i mention this is this has always been the embarrassing bastard stepchild of hollywood the liberals who run hollywood have always been embarrassed about these action films that make them a lot of money like rambo never give them any awards, never acknowledge them, but they take their money, which are some of the biggest grossing films in the history of Hollywood. So they snicker and they're smug about it and they'd rather make movies like Moonlight and you know La La Land and everything else uh, of that nature. But the movies that bring them the money are the Rambo films and the gangster pictures that put Warner Brothers on the map. I mean, uh, these are the films that, that are their bread and butter. I mean, it's going to be interesting to see if Hollywood goes along with this. Now, there's a history of them going along with it, obviously, because they mm -hmm. huge campaign against smoking cigarettes on screen, huge campaign against uh, using live animals. No animal was injured in the making of this film. All of that came from liberal causes and, and NGOs and think tanks and massive campaigns against Hollywood until they buckled. Uh, this may be a similar scenario, and it may have been you know, I, I don't know what Baldwin's intent was, but this is surely, you know, coming right into his wheelhouse politically. I mean, he's one of the biggest anti-Second Amendment advocates in, in the country. And, um, you know, he may go down as the guy who ended uh, live gunfire in Hollywood films. You know, he might. And, and to be clear to everyone, we're not saying definitively anything. This no, is all no, this is all theoretical. This is all and, jib jibber jabber. And I mean, uh, quite literally, I... As the intro was playing, somebody sent me a picture that's going to be used in the show. So we we are 
just responding and speculating and well how would you put it mark you said we're not connecting any dots right we're, we're just, just making the dots. that they're dots we're finding the dots that's up yeah. to you to connect the dots you want to get red string out put it on a wall we're just here this is an early stage of uh trying to find the dots that's all i'm trying to do not connect the dots that's for later or for you or for whoever can help us here to connect these dots we're trying to find dots that's how early into this investigation we are i don't know what the dots are let alone trying to connect them into some broad you know uh, um, situation that explains everything it's way too early i don't have any facts like that on my fingertips so i'm merely going to try to put out what what i found as an investigative reporter early on in an investigation as if i was working for you know doing a magazine piece or doing a piece for the weekly or whatever these are the bullet points that I found, and I hate to use the word bullet points, but uh, nevertheless, you know, that's where we are in this investigation. And essentially, too, um, not only is it possible that we'll be, a, we'll be wrong on points, you could expect us to be wrong on points. Oh, yeah, and, no, and absolutely. Yeah. We, yeah. We're actually, we're sharing research in real time. Yeah. And this is stuff therefore I mean, we're not cleaning up and double checking or things like that. No, we're just like, oh, no, hey, we're, we're no, just putting, this, out, putting out there. Everybody's on with a ride. And I really just want to make that clear. And also for the possibility of sabotage on the set, we're not even saying that somebody intended anyone to get shot. It is very possible that somebody could be disgruntled and they said, oh, yeah, this place is unsafe. I'll show you how unsafe it is. Drop a couple rounds in a box figuring that they get discovered and then they can raise hell about it or they would just get shot up and nobody actually gets shot. It would right. miss somebody, right. whatever, obviously right. still illegal, still horrible sabotage, but we're not claiming anything. We're, we're saying that's possible. Right. And we really, really just want to put that out there because during this episode, we're probably going to get a lot of pushback. And yeah. so this is going to be a very controversial episode, Eric. Now, I want to, yeah, oh, I guarantee it. We're, I want to start off then. We've got what's going on in the legislation, and comments have already talked about this, but the um, wardrobe manager has been reshared by Alec Baldwin talking about the set. Now, what struck me about this is it seems incredibly detailed and very specific. Right to maybe something that's not part of her job yeah you know about more about sets so you were going to explain to me why this didn't make any sense for her to be well it's extremely exploring. detailed and it seems to me to be coming from the line producer in the upm she's not uh, uh, the costume designer is not usually privy to what's going on with the camera crew and their hotel rooms and their schedule and everything else. This is far too detailed. It almost reads like a press release from the uh, line producer about uh, the internal controversies of the set. So, which may be true. They may be speaking through her. She may be friends with them, but the general gist of this is this was a well-oiled machine to quote Alec Baldwin. Uh, you know, keep in mind there is a crisis management team out there that is uh, intentionally trying to get to people to understand their point of view and Alec Baldwin's point of view that this was a well-oiled machine and he's not liable for any of this in terms of um, a dangerous set, let's say. So it, this being said, this is a long piece by this woman claiming that nothing unusual was happening on the set except a couple of bad boys and a camera crew complaining about their hotel rooms. Uh, it's, a, it's a strange, strange post uh, that reads uh, very disingenuously to me. And the fact that she is even uh, being able to access this information is crazy. This is not her world. I mean, she's on the back of a wardrobe truck, just, you know, physically, uh, on the side of the set, you know, giving out costumes and wardrobe and straightening out people's shirts and ironing uh, during the course of the day. She does talk to different people who come up to get the costumes who say this, that and the other thing. But it's the same as a hair and makeup woman uh, who sits there, you know, getting the beefs from the actors about this or that. The food is terrible. And that it's the same kind of a situation, you know, unless, like I said, she's talking to the um, producers who are speaking through her or the crisis management team, which is not unlikely. It could be true. Yeah. And then the 
the biggest points that strike me as odd with this too is first off we're only reading it because alec baldwin reshared it right i never would have found this four million instagrams or whatever right i went to find her instagram because i didn't realize it was coming from him and guess what what hers is private Oh, so you have course. to know her to ship. So, so she's making this giant statement, mm-hmm. but doesn't really have a public account. Like my account's public. What I put yeah, there, so is mine. it goes out to everybody. Uh, yeah. Your account, Twitter, everything we say is out there. Yeah. But, but that's, isn't that peculiar? You have something and you have a private account and then Alec Baldwin just happens to share. Yeah, it. I mean, I don't know who I mean, she's writing that to. In other words, if, if, if those are her friends on the thing, who is she writing that to? They already know where she stands and she's writing it back to the people who know this already. I mean, I, I don't know. It's a little strange, but I, you know, I just wanted to address the fact about Hannah Reed and, and the, the structure of these departments, as I was saying, the costume department is one department, but like I said to you the other day, a movie set is kind of like the army, Eric, mm-hmm. you know, there it's divided up into a very, very structured, bubble world of a military structure with the director and the producers on top and the keys are the heads of departments. Um, the AD is like the drill sergeant or the first chief sergeant, the first sergeant. Right. And everybody who's on board knows this. They know the role of each person. The keys are the keys of each department. She's the head of wardrobe. There's a prop head. There's the armorer. There's the AD. There's a second AD. There may be a second, second AD are his men underneath him, you know, men and women, uh, Mm -hmm. the camera crew, everybody eats in their own crew. Everybody eats in their own department. You don't say somebody from props eating with the camera crew. It's just not done. It's an extremely regimented military operation. And they, we call the people on the outside civilians, for instance, you know, when you're on the crew, you're boxed out from the outside world. It's a very insulated world. It's a very regimented world. And it's very cult-like, as I said that last week. It's a very cult-like world, you know, where everybody knows everybody's business. There's people having sex. There's people getting drunk. There's people shooting guns in the middle of the night. There's people hooking up. I mean, and then they break up. And that way, it's kind of like the circus. The carnival comes to town. Sure. People are roused about, they join the carnival in the middle of Missouri and it moves on, you know, and that's kind of what's going on here. These people are coming from different places. You have a crew um, coming out of Georgia, out of Thomasville, Georgia, from this company. Uh, That's where the line producer and the UPM come from. Some of the keys come out of Georgia. So they're dropped in the middle of New Mexico on a ranch and they're dealing with people from a rural area or Santa Fe or, or Albuquerque who are coming in including this Sarah Zachary, who I wanted to address is kind of a mystery woman because Sarah Zachary is the prop master who comes in five days before the shooting, replacing the prop master who walks off because of safety and fi- and financial reasons. Um, this person who walks off, we don't know the name of that person, And we can't really find a background on Sarah Zachary that much, although she does have two or three credits as props. Right, Eric? Yeah, she's got a couple of credits and I don't have it ready to pull up. I found I found some pictures that I think are her, but uh, she's she's very, very hard to track down. And well, um, the point I'm trying to make is the lawyers for Hannah Reed announced finally the second department she was working in. Now, this is highly unusual that anybody who was the head of a department would be working in another department. I I asked a lot of people here in town in Hollywood, have they ever heard of this? She not only is the head of the gun department as the armorer, she's also assistant props. And from what I understand, when the prop master walked, she became the prop master until Sarah Zachary arrived and then became assistant props to Sarah Zachary. This I've never heard of this. No one I know has ever heard of this. This is a uh, a very, very unusual move. I assume they probably gave her the pay for the assistant props weekly salary on top of her weekly salary of this low budget indie, which may have been incentive for her to do it. You know, keep in mind, there may be these shootouts or gun days, quote unquote, you know, five or six gun days on a 21 day shoot. So she may have a lot of downtime. However, according to her lawyers, She wasn't around after she put the three guns out on the cart and asked people to keep an eye on the guns on the cart. 
because she had to go to her second job. This is incredibly, incredibly rare. I can't stress that enough. The fact that she's working in another department on a Western, on a period piece, in props is a lot of work. Okay? That's a lot of work in a, in a, in a period piece to deal with props. You're talking about cowboy hats, guns. You're talking about spurs, saddles, coffee pots, uh, you know, well, yeah, jewelry. Well, yeah, I mean, everything that's a prop in a Western. Uh, not to mention making sure nothing's there that's not supposed to be there. Because I don't know if she's a... Well, that's, is that a script supervisor? Never mind. I don't right. Know. That's a script supervisor. But I mean, she's assisting this new person, Sarah Zachary, who doesn't have many credits herself, who is the prop master, by the way. She comes on five days before, and now she's working with Hannah Reed, uh, whose background was in wardrobe, by the way. You know, before this, she had some wardrobe credits, but I thought she might have been working with the, with the uh, wardrobe designer. But the, the lawyer, the reason I'm bringing this up is the lawyers for the first time revealed on uh, Savannah Guthrie's show. Oh, thanks for stopping by. <laughs> hey, I'm hey. like Alec Baldwin. I'm coming in. Guns are blazing. Oh, so, <laughs> you know, you're, you're quite a straight shooter, Barnes. That's what I like about you. He's quite a straight shooter. Did you see that uh, story? I mean, like her lawyers are out there basically going after Baldwin now? Uh, you're talking about Hannah Reed's lawyers? Yeah. Yeah. Well, the sabotage thing I thought was coming. I, I kind of predicted that would happen. Yeah. Because, you know, it's not that far-fetched that a disgruntled guy, we were talking earlier, some disgruntled crew member who's leaving could put a couple of live rounds in the box or in the gun or any combination of things, not intending to kill anybody, you know, but just to have a live round go off, would, you know, could lead to a lot of different safety measures being enhanced. Their beef was safety and having a live round go off on a set in the middle of a shoot or rehearsal could make a valid point to a disgruntled employee, Robert, right? Yeah. And I assume that, you know, if you're, what's fascinating is you have both a, uh, communications team, you know, doing its motivation thing. And then you got a legal defense team doing its thing for all the different participants. I mean, I took it that her lawyers are mad at Baldwin's crisis communications team. That's for what I was thinking. Throwing her under the bus early. So they're paying him right. back for that. Right. Um, but if you're, if you're anybody that faces liability, what's your best defense? Isn't sabotage your best defense? Sabotage is a great defense because a, you don't have to prove who did the sabotage. Yep. It's just a generic sabotage. It could have, there's 90 people on the set, Robert, not to mention security guards with live rounds in their own guns. I mean, you know, there's people in Albuquerque and Santa Fe who do have guns, you know, who do go out plinking at night. You know, I mean, even if she got drunk and went out and took her own guns and shot some cans at night, that's what armorers do at night. That's what they do on a set is shoot guns, their own right. guns, and they shoot cans and whatever they do. I don't begrudge her for doing that if that was the case. Do you th are her lawyers telling the truth when they claim that uh, Baldwin was specifically told never to point the gun at anyone? You know, I wanted to address this because I talked to a couple of action movie stars who are friends of mine. And here's a dirty little secret. There are A-list stars who check the guns and there's A-list stars that don't check the guns. And Baldwin is known as an A-list star that doesn't check the gun. OK, everybody knows this. Every AD in town knows this. A guy like Jeffrey Wright always fanatically checks the gun. So there's two types of stars, and he is the other type, if that makes any sense to anybody. Everybody right. knows that. And, and look, I'm not knocking him. I think most A-list stars don't check the gun. They got far too much on their mind. I was just telling Eric, I got a piece of the script, and that scene that he was supposedly in a single point of view shot shooting the camera was actually designed to be a massive shootout with three guys in that barn all day. There would have been hundreds of hundreds of blank rounds being shot later in after lunch. So the whole misnomer that this guy was shooting a single round into a camera in a point of view shot was a crock of shit. This was going to be the third act massive shootout for the end of this film that afternoon, which nobody realized. If you look at the script, you'll see that. Now on to um, Barnes. I, I'm glad you got on here because we were talking about the crisis communications and how the um, wardrobe manager coincidentally released that nice long Instagram statement that did, like broke down um, every grievance that let's say the line producer, as Mark put, might have had with um, you know saying, oh, well, there's a couple troublemakers, and remember Alec Baldwin on the side of the road said that everything is running like a top; it was perfectly smooth, well oiled machine. Well-oiled machine, all of that. Now, 
we found it very suspect because she's not the appropriate person, has no relevance, wouldn't know anything about the camera crew or whatever, because she doesn't work there. Why so much specific detail? And our speculation is that the crisis communication team, she would be a fantastic candidate to put out a um, well-targeted long message. Is that something you've seen before? Well, I mean, I've uh, been up close and personal with crisis communications teams in, in L.A., mm-hmm. and they, they are the best the best in the world at what they do. Um, they're, they're, I mean, what's interesting is the most famous one, his, fav- his favorite or his most lucrative clientele are all people accused of uh, child porn or kitty issues, right? So gives you a sense for their moral compass isn't exactly, you know, too much of the focus. They got a monetary compass, but they are very good at planning stories in so many different places. Better, yeah. honestly, than a lot of the political machinery is in terms of knowing where to play outside of your actual deep state operators. Uh, you know, your ordinary political consultants could learn a lot of lessons from the wag the dog of Hollywood. Um, and the uh, the so there's a lot of and it was clear right away how skilled they were because they're blaming everybody but Alec Baldwin within 24 hours. Right. You know, I mean, they I mean, I mean, would, did somebody really stumble across her TikTok or was that planted right there for look at this photo? Look at yeah. that. Look at yeah. this. Well, even, yeah. including, like I said earlier, before you came on, the legislation up in Sacramento seemed to have been pre-written, Robert, to ban guns from sets and to ban blanks. That seemed to be written and ready to go into the hopper to Newsom's signature. I mean, exactly. this film in New Mexico switches to rubber guns the next day saying we're going to do all CGI. I, I, this thing seemed like it was it was kind of ready to go. Absolutely. And, and they clearly pulled the trigger everywhere. <laughs> that was X and X. You're a well-oiled machine, Robert. <laughs> yeah, exactly. The, uh, I mean, they just went quickly on everything. It was boom, right. boom, boom. Uh, right. Well-organized, well-orchestrated, uh, well done. I mean, I think Baldwin probably went off script with his little routine, probably because the wife was nuts. Right. So, you know, when Greg Hartley and Viva and I were breaking it down, I didn't even process it till watching it live that there might be some sort of backstory between Baldwin and the woman he shot that uh, maybe it was nothing, but like both of them had a reaction to each other. It's like, I've seen that before. And usually that you're not supposed to talk about uh, the, 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 uh, the relationship you've just got over or whatever. I just, it had a little bit of that vibe, not, not a lot, but enough of it that, you know, if this was a mystery show, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it'd be, it'd be worth uh, going down that road to see what it, it ended up. But I agree that, I mean, if, if Baldwin's a guy that's not known for checking things, uh, then and then the question becomes, was Baldwin told, why would he be, well, maybe he didn't point it at anyone. Maybe he was pointing it at the camera. Uh, but, right. you know, is that normal? That the, I mean, that doesn't quite make sense to me, because the point I thought of using the, the prop guns, of using the gun uh, on set, is to point it at people frequently. So I, oh, oh absolutely. I mean, what, what was going to transpire moments later is him mortally wounded. He runs into the church. He has one of his men with him who runs out the back door. He has three bad guys come in and it's a massive shootout. I mean, there there's going to be a lot of rounds fired, uh, quote unquote, and there's going to be a lot of squibs and there's going to be a lot of blood. That's what's coming after lunch. And that's why Halls is so aggressive because he knows as the AD how difficult this day is going to be with right. the shootout. It's the biggest thing. It's the end of yeah, the, it's film. the money day. It's half the budget. Probably. And, absolutely. That is the biggest day. And, you know, when I'm that's when probably I'm, also why they walked off that morning of then I, I that's why the camera crew left and and the right. camera crew left on the biggest day of the of the year, you know, for this yeah. particular film. This was the money day and Hollywood you know, unions are ruthless. Yeah, it's funny how nobody mentioned the fact that this was going to be the big shootout in the third act of the script. You know, I've uh, never seen that. that. That's something that yeah, I think is being broke here. Right. I don't. Nobody awkward. has seen that. I stumbled somehow. Got a page out of that script. It, it was but, in the bottle that floated to the shore. It's in the bottle. Exactly. That exactly. Yeah. They, 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 they comes to me in Vegas. Yeah. With the, right. Uh, that's know, the same bottle, bottle Robert. Yeah. 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 Came yeah. down yeah. the LA yeah. River. I got it on the LA River this morning. You know? You're sharing you go. that. Going back and forth. Okay. So. To the next subject. Oh, boy. And, uh, okay. This is the one. I'm sorry you're going to have to hear this, Robert, but this is, <laughs> we're channeling our, our inner uh, AJ on this. Yeah, this, well, is, this is AJ time, brother. Yeah, it's it's going to be interesting, but um, I want to make something really in. clearly, uh, really clear. We're going to be talking about the past of Elena. We are not... 
in any way talking poorly about her character or anything else. This is just a historical exploration of her and people who are around her. And the last thing we want to do is, you know, in any way, say anything that looks bad on her memory or anything else. And I just want to get that right out the gate because I I know that people may feel that that's happening. Not going to happen I don't, here. Yeah. It, it is not happening here. We're just talking about her legacy. She seems like an amazing woman, actually, with a pretty powerful woman. Um, and maybe got caught up in a bad situation. Also the husband. Oh, we're yeah. So we're definitely going to be talking, you know, about the husband, but they have some kind of a past, and it's very, very interesting. So this, the rest of the show is pretty much going to be about her career, people around her who may have well, influenced her. Things these are also story. the the dots that we've uncovered, as we said earlier. We're not connecting right. these dots. These are the dots, though. Yeah, gonna, they're just dots. Know, these are just dots. We're not connecting these dots. We're just giving you facts of what we've, what I've uncovered in the past couple of weeks here. So uh, this is what it is. I, I don't know where it goes or what happens. It's a little too early in the investigation, but this is what I've uncovered. And let the shit fly where it flies, brother, because this is all, <laughs> this, this is all true, and I'm shocked what I found. So strap yourself in at home because it's going to be a bumpy ride. So where do we go first? Okay, so let's just go with her background. I mean, 1979, Murmansk, up there at the Arctic Circle, not your typical cinematographer. She's born in the Soviet Union. And, um, okay, you happy now? She's now in the Soviet Union. It's 1979. How you get from here, from that point, that dot to Hollywood? It's a strange road, my friend. So let's take <laughs> a look at her dad, Eric. Let's see Let's see what the dad is like. All right, hang on. Let's, let's just start with the, with the family, because... That's in this cool. type of world that I've stumbled into, these families are very interconnected in terms of what they do. Well, from my understanding, her her dad was in the military. That's right, and and he um, was a submarine captain. So that's right. So he has trained most of their officer corps. He's nearly a legend in the submarine community. The most deadly submarine ever built. This thing could park a couple of hundred warheads off Washington. Nobody'd know a thing about it until it was all over. And once more, we play our dangerous game without all the vessels in the American Navy. Okay. Well, maybe that wasn't exactly that, a picture of that, that. You see Alec Baldwin in there? That's who her yes. dad was. Her dad is Sean Connery in that movie. Her dad was the top Soviet nuclear sub commander in the mask. Here's the father. Really? Robert, yeah. strap yourself in. That's the dad, bro. We believe this is him. Okay. I, this is one of those, again, I, I took a lot of work. I found two pictures of the guy out there using Ukrainian sources, things like that. Everything seems to line up that this is him. Right? Well, I mean, uh, does it? I mean, he kind of looks like him. I mean, there's, oh, there's no, no, no. This is him. Yeah. This is the same name. Everything's the same. Same date, everything. Wow. Now, show the next photo, Eric. Show us the next photo. Um, you'll see him a little later. There he is. This is after the fall of the Soviet Union. He now teaches in a Ukrainian university at a Kiev. Um, Head of the, uh, now listen to this part of the story. She goes to school in, in, in uh, you know, in the 1980s, 1990s, and uh, becomes a journalist where she gets involved in now the Soviet Union collapses and she begins to work as an investigative reporter, Robert. And she begins to work for a guy who is working in the MI6 anti-Russian propaganda department for the Daily Mail, who has really? his own. Oh, yes, my friend. The plot <laughs> thick Oh, yeah. I'm glad you stopped by, Robert. I mean, I'm gonna make it worth your fucking while. Today. What, what's the guy's name, Mark? The guy's name is um. Let's see if we can find his name here. Let's see. Um, Will and, Stewart? Will Stewart. Yeah, Will Stewart. Um, I got a bomb a, to drop on you, Mark. Yeah, Will Stewart is a guy who has... Uh, oh, no. No, you found him. I Fantastic, found him. Eric. That came Will, in during the credits. Will Stewart <laughs> is the Daily Mail's or the Red Top, the Red Top uh, periodicals in England's Man in Moscow. Works with MI6. He is a anti-Russian propagandist for the British. He cranks out 200 stories a week, salacious stories against Putin, the Russians, sex, mm -hmm. sex slaves, women getting eaten by men, uh, everything you can imagine. You can Google this guy's storylines. 
They make it to the New York Post sometimes. They make it all through uh, Europe. This is all he does, Robert, is come up with these stories. There's some of his on Twitter, uh, all the salacious stuff. <laughs> You're not she, kidding. She, no, 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 brother. She worked for him. She was his girl in Kiev and in Moscow coming up with these stories. She then is funneled into the documentary department of an organization called the BBC, where she works for a guy named Richard Denton. These are all pro-Soviet people in England. These are pro-Soviets now. The Soviet Union has collapsed. Some of them immigrated to the United States. Is this Denton, by the way, Eric? Yeah. yeah. Okay. This is Richard Denton. He makes a documentary for the BBC in 1989 called Comrades a pro-Soviet documentary it becomes a national scandal in England. He stays on. He's one of the most famous documentarians in, in England. He has a company called Wild Pictures, which she works for with him. And she is his girl who comes up, uh, up the ranks working on these documentaries with him that are now virulently anti-Putin and anti-Russian. These are pro-Soviet Brits who are working for MI6 within the BBC. OK, she works on such documentaries as I'm sure you love to see this one, Sex Slaves in the Cellar. OK, one of the top ones about Russian uh, girls. You can't make this up. Se the world's tallest Ukrainian man ends up on the Discovery Channel. She's the girl. He's using her to go into the Ukraine and go into Russia in a post-Soviet era and pull out these storylines. And she's also uh, I mean, both of these guys have acknowledged her. I'm not making this up. The guy that we just mentioned, uh, uh, Will Stewart mentions her, that he mourns her loss. Richard Denton mourns her loss. These are not, we're not cherry picking these names. These are people who have acknowledged relationships professionally with her going up to 2008 in England and Moscow and Kiev. Okay. So this is where she's coming from. She's working for MI6 in the propaganda department against the, uh, the Putin and Russian uh, government at this time. Okay. How did how did she get to the states? That's what we're going to tell you right now. Well, she, <laughs> Good she question, get, my friend. She did get married. Here's her. Here's her marriage. <laughs> she marries this guy, and his name is is Matthew, Matthew Hutchins, Hutchins. Right. This is around 2005, Eric. Um. Yeah, it would have to be around that time. Yeah. 2005, um, let's say. Yeah. This is now the one of the kind of around. Right. Um, this is obviously three years or two years later. Sure, but sure. going back to that photo, if you could just go back to the wedding photo, uh, I believe that this is a doctored photo because the the father figure on the right with the bald head is not the same father she started off yeah. with. This is <laughs> yes. airbrushed in. This is not her father on the right. This could be her brother for all I know. But yeah, that's is, what I was going to say. You'd think almost maybe a brother in the military. Right. This might be her brother. Her, her sister, who is extremely beautiful, works some for some reason in a place called indonesia and in some security job by the way separate storyline yes because families stick together robert and this reminded me this arranged marriage where you have this situation reminded me of marina oswald having the arranged married with lee harvey oswald in in minsk her father was the head of the soviet um fbi at the time and this this father here is um soviet royalty the father who uh, who was the captain of this of the nuclear submarines. He's Soviet is, royal. Is that her sister or her mother? That's it's a, I, I don't know. It's supposed to be her mother. Her sister is younger than her by 10 years and absolutely stunning oh. in Indonesia. The sister has come out. There's a photo of her around. Are they? I had the photo. I, are they from I Ukraine started. originally? Yes. They're, no, no, but they're from Murmansk. Keep in mind, they're from, from the, okay. the Arctic Circle. That's where she was raised and born at mm -hmm. the Murmansk naval base where the nuclear subs are based. Uh, that's where are she's they born. An ancestrally from Ukraine? Yes. Yes. Because yes. I don't know if you know the whole history about uh, part, you know, why there's these so many crazy, beautiful women in Ukraine. I'd like to know that. Uh, Peter, Peter the Great uh wanted when he you know he established his base there uh, on the black sea mm -hmm. he wanted to make sure that he could get sailors to leave russia uh and go to uh and this is, this is at least the legend right uh, to go to station there on the black sea away from all their family oh that's so great. he basically recruited the, some of the most beautiful women from all around the world to to go there and that that's the story purportedly they, they have a crazy that's why he's great 
Yeah, that well, he is Peter. The that's Great, pretty good. I don't know. That's the story that I heard from a Ukrainian. Wow. That, that that was I've the history. I've Came never from, heard that. But yeah, they're based in Kiev. They're the yeah, family. So it's so. a. I mean, they're like the ancestral history of like Ukrainian women genetically is very unique, right. very distinct. Like the only place that's com- almost comparable is like Brazil, and right. that's why you get disproportionate number of models from Ukraine. To, you know, all of that. Right. Well. The father says he can't get here for reasons I don't understand to his daughter's funeral. He says he can't. He's battling with the forces of immigration to get here. And I'm thinking there's people who fly from Kiev to L.A. every single hour. I don't know yeah, what his that, problem that is, is. That is unusual. Yes. Thank you. That's another. Uh, weird uh, unless, one. of course, maybe there could be some issues between him and the uh uh, government or some government of some kind. Well, it wouldn't be well, a Russian problem. He could no, leave. no, no. And you could That's see a U.S. You could see why problem. a Ukrainian, a Ukrainian from Kiev would be anti-Putin and anti-Russian, working yeah. with the British and MI6. Robert, right? Right. I mean, that yeah. thing kind of fits. That together. wouldn't normally be a problem to come into the U.S. unless you've got a problem at the U.S. border. Right. Right. Well, well she, somebody you know, doesn't want you here for some reason. Right. Well, she doesn't come here till I think about 2008, right? Or 2009. Because she goes Something to school. Like she goes to UCL. She goes to film school. In oh, so she met her husband over Yes, school. that's over there. The husband. We're going to get to the husband who deals in international takeovers of corporations and maybe mm-hmm. in the Ukraine, Robert. When the Actually, Ukraine let's... was coming apart at the seams, the husband seems to be there for an unusually obscure law firm named uh, Kirkland and Ellis. <laughs> All right. So before we get into it, Mark, um, yeah. there is a reason that you uh, were triggered to go down this path. And essentially there's a rumor out that her next project was a oh, document, right. was a documentary about, um, shall we say, uh, uh, sexual predators. Well, I mean, I've heard sex trafficking, Hollywood pedophilia. She's right. done this before. It's not so unusual. Right, right. Well, unusual. She did the, you know, the slaves she did in the sex basement. slaves in the cellar, so. one of my favorite documentaries of all time for Channel 5 in England. And However, Russian you, sex slaves, by the way. What triggered you, though, was the second that that came out, all of a sudden, political yeah. act and Snopes. Yeah, Snopes and Jumped political all over were, it. They were on this in a millisecond, just this one little angle to her life. They came down on this so hard, it triggered every red flag in my in my brain that there, <laughs> this was a true story. And um, the Snopes guy may be protecting something of his own life, Eric. Yeah, we see he has a background. And I, I've shared this with Mark where, um, you know, he started Snopes out. He and that's Barbara. Mrs. Snopes, right? Yep. The, see, I'm original Mrs. Snopes. Absolutely. Right. David Mickelson and Mrs. Snopes. But. They their relationship kind of broke up and no. oh, somebody boy. else moved into his oh life. boy, oh boy, that um, looks like Vegas, Eric. <laughs> that, as a matter of fact, is uh Vegas, okay. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> so, yeah. she uh, that's the new Mrs. Snopes, Eric. That is the new Mrs. Snopes. Oh dear god, um, well, I mean, I should have gone into happy. the Snopes business, <laughs> they're, they're really, really happy, and right. again, uh, you know what, that's perfectly fine. Is you she a no, she's in a That Snopes guy looks like a Thailand tourist. You know what I'm talking about? You know what I mean? That uh, look, yeah. that what does she do for a living, Eric? Well, you see, she is an independent escort. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. Out of Vegas. And again, oh, boy. Uh, no, look, no shame. Has marry, that been confirmed by PolitiFact? Marry for your love. Oh, uh, it's confirmed everywhere. Right. And it can get really deeply confirmed. Look up her name, Erin O'Brien. If you dare, don't do it in front of your children. Oh, you think that's her, her real name? No, Maybe. that's her stage name. Her that's real name. I was, I'd be surprised it, if it was a real name. So yeah, you believe real, you believe that Snopes may have a dog in this hunt? I th- I think that um I think that people who live in glass houses shouldn't be throwing stones. Wow. That's all I'm saying. Wow. And again, uh, I'm not going to criticize him for somebody he loves. But I am going to criticize him for going after other people. Hold on a second. When he fell in love with the been. escort. Yeah. Pretty pretty woman. Yeah. He married pretty the woman. escort? Yes. She's yes. the new Mrs. Snopes, Robert. That's what we're trying to tell you. <laughs> okay. These are some I, of the dots we're trying to connect, Robert. Yeah. 
<laughs> anyway, so but that's a, just a little side note. He but it's like, this. So yeah. Robert, this <laughs> is all the dots we've uncovered. You know, while wow. you were busy, we were well, doing we this. Promised, <laughs> we promised you that you would find this interesting. And right. Engaging. When you come on this <laughs> yeah, show, no we're not going to waste your time. We're going to give you some bombshells here, Robert. <laughs> Oh, okay, man. so he marries the escort. She's working on a documentary, let's say, with, with BBC, her connections with, with Denton. Maybe she's working on a Hollywood pedophilia. Maybe it's sex trafficking in Hollywood. Who knows? We don't really know, but it's not unusual for her to be doing this because she's done it before. Okay, maybe there's Russians involved in Hollywood, sex tra Who knows? I, I would be involved in this documentary if somebody. Well, you know, uh, the, the, there's some stories I could tell, but not live. Right. right. <laughs> and look, does it exist here? You bet your ass it does. Okay, if she wants to make a doc about it, I got a feeling that some people might not be too happy. Let's just oh, leave it at that. That's an understatement. Okay, well, let's just leave it at that. You yeah. know, uh, if you combine something, you know, with that and, and you I mean, know, there's maybe... a reason why nobody mainstream has made a documentary since the disguise documentary by Stanley Kubrick of Eyes Wide Shut. That's right. That's you right. Know? And that barely got out alive. The he, uh, Well, he, didn't he die? He died, the, but he died before, the was film, before it was, the film was actually shown, right? Yeah, that's right. That is true. The same. It is true. Well, she, right. you know, maybe she goes rogue, Eric. Maybe she says she's told not to make the documentary. They're pulling the funding. Who knows? Maybe she goes rogue and she's a bigger hero than we think she is. Maybe she's a martyr here. Maybe, maybe this oh, was a political I, I, assassination. I don't really know. I'm just putting that out there, bro, because of her background with MI6, her background with this Will Stewart, her background making sexual documentaries in England, working with Richard Richard Denton, a pro-Soviet. I mean, she would be uniquely well positioned to yep. make such a documentary. Absolutely. Absolutely. International uh, background in Russia. She's worked on the sex sex slave trade of Russian girls. She's here in Hollywood. She's probably experienced it here. She probably knows well, about true it. True Detective season two. Remember what that was mostly it was largely about? Right. I have to look I mean, at that. The yeah. Russian connection is strong. Russia. That's right. Well, even the one she did in for the BBC was Russian girls. So that's not so far fetched. The, and uh, she might have thought she was doing just, you know, these were really legitimate. I'm sure they were for her. Right. And they maybe were legitimate documentaries, but may not have understood they were for an ulterior purpose of the people that she was producing them. Right. For. Right. Exactly. Her that, goal was let's expose sex trafficking. Let's stop sex trafficking. Right. That and, would logically and, lead you to certain places in Hollywood. It's just you know, now the politics has shifted in terms of the people who would have an interest or not have an interest in that becoming public knowledge. Right. Somebody, so, yeah, somebody may somebody may have pulled a plug on it, too. And she said, go fuck yourself. I'm still going to make it alienating even more people. You know what I mean? Right. Oh, yeah. And, oh, yeah. And if you mix she in also this... might have stumbled into some stories. There's a lot right. of That's, stories. Right. There. Right. I mean, right. I had a client. Well, I can't get into much, but there are some people that have achieved fame and money in Hollywood based on just blackmailing and extorting people based on setting people up in those situations. Who, um, who would be more interested in that than the intelligence services, Robert? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. Speaking of which, um, let's start looking at hubby. Oh, the husband. Now, now. Oh my God, this is now this, Robert, this is going to be good for you, Robert. Oh yeah, definitely. Well, now, oh, this what is I like about this is yeah. What I love about this is we're not slinging arrows here. Nope. This is his LinkedIn page. Yep. Created by him. That's right. We're just going to take a tour mm -hmm. of his career, mm -hmm. and we're first off saying, where did they meet? How would he have met her? Things like that. So we need to go all the way back and see. When did he graduate from Harvard? Yeah, go back. Yeah, yeah Harvard. And not only graduate from Harvard. Oh, he's young. Oh, yeah. 38, 38. But let's start here. Editor in chief of the Harvard Law Record. Who else did? Who that? else was editor in chief <laughs> of uh, Harvard Review? What other famous president it, was the Is Harvard was... Law Record their version of Harvard Law Review, or is it one of their other? publications I, that's a I'm good question sure. I, i'm just familiar with the harvard lampoon that's the only one i know ah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well he's from south carolina originally yeah 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 yeah, yeah. he kind of looks like it too any knowledge of what his parents were not yet we haven't, we're gotten, that we far haven't yet. gotten that far yet we haven't gotten I mean, literally we've been harvard doing this today how's he get to harvard we don't know yeah that's, an that's a great question we're trying to figure that well, out maybe maybe i don't know but um so it's clerks possible in bankruptcy barnes that uh Maybe because he spent some time as a teacher in International House. Yes, the International House. That might have House. gotten him into Harvard. See, yeah. 2006. International what House. Is, that's Spookville City over there. Well, yeah, I was going to say, what is International House? It is a Rockefeller set up since 1929, a center of world uh, uh, leaders of the future where kids meet and become spooks. 
Oh, is is that the place where what's his name? The guy that Navalny actually was associated with a few like uh-huh. eight years ago, ten years ago. Yep. That yep. they tie yep. in. There's one at Berkeley. Oh, wow. There's one at the University of Chicago. There's one at Georgetown, and oh. they meet there. These yeah, are so that's that would be the ticket to Harvard. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because yeah. University you... of South Carolina economics that doesn't no, get no, no, no. Somehow he goes to Georgetown, I think, and ends up in there, probably International House there. Um, but this is Spookville Center International House, set up by the Rockefellers in the 1930s. And so right, the so... Uh, and from there, clerks for uh, a bankrupt. That's usually if you're going to enter into commercial law, is why you would clerk for a bankruptcy judge. Because right. Well, he, he kind of does for, for uh, uh, Kirkland Ellis because he ends up overseas in the Ukraine in mergers and acquisitions, uh, uh, Robert. So that that not out of the question there. What's that innovation programs committee? That we don't know. That's a defunct Web page. We don't know what that is yet. Yeah, we haven't so gotten decides to go these. to <laughs> goes from New York to L.A. Right. But that's Gad Narps is the biggest corporate law firm in the world. Right. Or was at the time. I don't know if it's still is, but it was at the time. Well, so he's still up. He's there. been in three of the biggest in and the world. And he goes right, part. goes into corporate seat. Yeah, see the corporate seat. Yeah. <laughs> Bankruptcy court would say economics, you're you're in the uh mergers and acquisition world. Right. Uh, so he's somehow world. running around the Ukraine looking to acquire for clients something to what merge is or TPG acquire. TPG Global. He's only there uh, a short time. Yeah. Also, how did he okay? He skips from Skadden Arps over to Kirkland and Ellis, and TGP yes. Global is just uh, long for the ride while he's at Kirkland well, and Ellis. Well, mergers and acquisitions, I've got a, a theory on that, and you can help me out, Barnes, but could he have been planted as a company member like pre-acquisition? Like one of those hatchet men gets hired in, you know, cuts some heads off, and then goes on to the next company? I mean, what is unusual is hopping around like this. Yes. Uh, yeah, going mm-hmm. from Skadden Arps to Kirkland and Ellis to Latham and Watkins, not yep. being in any one place. Yep. Like if your goal is to be partner, you don't do that. Uh, because uh, uh, the only way you can afford to do this typically is if you've got some well-connected clientele of some type or sponsors or a benefactor. Benefactor. Correct. Yeah. <laughs> was, there's some <laughs> reason why, because normally they don't like, like your Kirkland and Ellis, they don't usually take a you know a third year, fourth year associate as a trans as a lateral transfer, right? And then definitely not Latham and Watkins take somebody who's now, you know, on paper this looks like a burnout, right? Yeah, it, like, yeah, they, yeah. They, they say no. Like when I was applying, I made the mistake uh, my first set uh, first semester, second year of law school is when you do all the corporate interviews mm-hmm. to get a corporate summer gig, and that's when you usually get placed after that. Um, and the uh, I made the mistake of telling them the Yale story straightforwardly, which was oh, inco- wow. which was incredibly dumb. The uh, I did eight interviews, got no callbacks, and I was like, hey, "Man, wow, how's this working?" <laughs> I, I was just wanting to get all the free food, the free wine, and get into the free trips. You know, then I'd figure out someplace to cash in for the summer, mm-hmm. and then I was never going to take this job long term. But uh, I was getting you know stiffed on the free food, so the uh, I finally figured out that some one of the people interviewing me said, "You realize the story you're telling." Uh, doesn't sound like a corporate lawyer story. And I was like, oh, yeah. So I had to totally change my whole story. I left because my mom got sick or I forget how I changed it. Right, it was technically right. true, but not the whole truth. Right. Uh, but I mean, that's the, the day uh, when I, you know, later on, they made clear they don't like anybody hopping between firms. The only people who right. do this are rainmakers or people with benefactors, particularly young associates. Right. This yeah. isn't a guy with a normal uh, profile of, you know, five big clients. He's taken with him as a third year, fourth year associate. Well, one of the big clients at Kirkland Ellis uh, at that time was an obscure uh, guy named uh, Jeffrey Epstein. Mm. Now, Epstein's there and as a client uh, while he is there, which is kind of unusual if your wife is making a documentary about sex trafficking uh, a number (laughs) of years later. Another guy who's there before he uh, becomes attorney general is William Barr at that time. And uh, this guy, John Bolton, who does not really Mm. like Russia (laughs) <laughs> at all he's over there too and there's also an obscure uh, supreme court judge uh of the future who's who was there at the same time robert when did he meet his wife in 2005 Five, we're guessing so when he was at that international house then. Yeah. yeah yeah well they were married 16 years according to the press so it'd be 2005 so he met her while he was uh in the international house that's right because uh-huh. it's weird to be in ukraine 
I mean, that's just not a normal. Well, place that's where he, he has his wedding over there. I mean, the, he goes over there, meets the family. The father's a Soviet naval captain of the highest order. I mean, give me a break. Mm -hmm. Now he's mingling with these cats over Kirk and Ellis. I, I mean, it, it's too much, Robert. It's too much. There's too many dots. I can't live with myself. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the how he met Look at his this wife. guy. Look how happy he is because his father hired Jeffrey Epstein to be a that's teacher true. at Horace Mann, as we now know. Yes. And here's Jeffrey himself, who obviously did and not... his father, remember, wrote that weird book. Yes. I'd Space like to get aliens my hands on and, that book. You know, yeah. Going after young girls and all this right, stuff. Right, right, right. Bill Barr's father, that is. Bill Barr's father, right, who hires Jeffrey Epstein to be a teacher without any credentials whatsoever. Then writes uh, a book about interest in underage sexual activity. Who, you know, mm. it, it brings you back to Sex Slaves in the Cellar again, one of my favorite documentaries <laughs> of all time. <laughs> All roads channel so five. So, oh, so this is still his experience. So he's at Kirkland yeah. and Ellis. Then he gets mm -hmm. a private gig at STX Entertainment. Who right. then becomes Euros STX. We think that's the same company. Yeah, I'm sure it is. It is the same company. They make some films out of India, it looks like South Asia. Um, I, first, I thought it was a porn thing because of Eros, but it's not. It seems to look, <laughs> it's based in Burbank, but they're mostly films out of India um this, wow, that's a been. weird tramp that is a Thank weird you. career that's why we wanted you to look at this because then, we couldn't uh, we couldn't figure this out he goes to three months he goes to the kentucky whiskey company as general counsel rob man that is that is really odd and then latham and watkins takes him back that's or, where i mean he is, no, that's no, where he is now that's i mean this guy third you'll, you'll, major major you won't find this resume at, hardly at all in corporate law well, Michael Sussman is there now, the Clinton lawyer. So they needed him to be there for, for the Clinton lawyer, Michael Sussman, who is now a client of him there. Oh, you mean the indicted lawyer? Yes, yes. He's the being Lincoln represented and by Latham and Watkins in yes. this group. They represent the Clinton folks. So he's he got hired, it all covered. Latham and Watkins. Really? That's interesting. Thank you. The Because uh, that's, that's a West Coast firm, primarily. That's right. It's right here. It's on Spring Street. Yep, yep, yep. They get I in thought you'd know this. Santa Monica and, and, and yeah, Santa I'm familiar Monica. with all these firms. Now, he it's lives a, in Venice, so I assume he's going to the Santa Monica office. He lives in Venice Beach. Uh yeah, no, nice place. Thank you. I mean, but that's a strange uh that is a very strange, very strange career. Right. Here are his interests, by the way. Mark Cuban. He loves Mark Cuban, he loves Bill Gates, and he loves Justin Trudeau, Viva's favorite politician. <laughs> <laughs> That is an un odd, odd history. We thought the audience at home might be interested in these dots. Can I connect yeah. them all? Absolutely not. This is right. what we've uncovered. I have no idea how they connect, but this is the strangest series of dots I've ever seen from a movie where somebody gets injured on a set. Okay, yeah. this is just bizarre. You know, no the doubt. fact that they're they're moving at lightning speed to ban guns from films you know, they've had success banning cigarettes. They've had success with PETA banning uh, anything happening to animals. And this seems like if we can't change the country, let's change the culture. Mm -hmm. They are making a move to get rid of these guns as at lightning speed. I mean, right. Dershowitz wrote this editorial um, for Newsweek this week saying there's no Second Amendment on a film set. You know, we've got to use rubber guns. This 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 group in uh, the making this film locksmith down in New Mexico switches to rubber guns the next day. You know, this could be a cultural thing internally in Hollywood, Robert, you know, mm -hmm. to, to get rid of guns in Hollywood at least, because they can't do it in the country. They can't do it legislatively. They can't do it legally. They probably said, fuck it. We got rid of cigarettes. We got rid of animal cruelty. Let's get rid of guns. Mm -hmm. You know, and maybe Al in back on about the cigarettes. Yes. Cigarettes are still in films, but the rated R. They made right. it restricted, right. restricted. So kids couldn't watch it. So that's right. right. Well, right. we're being elusive. Uh, somebody pointed out you had the wrong school that Epstein was at the Dalton school. A Dalton school. school, big deal, so, big fuck. Sorry. Thank you, Saul. Thank you, <laughs> <laughs> thank you for helping me. You really are a lot of help. Thank you. As I said early on, uh, not only is it possible we will make mistakes, it's guaranteed we're going to make mistakes because right. we're doing this on the fly. Right. It's but, there's no doubt it's an odd history. It's odd how you. how he met. Uh, met his wife. That's that's just not a normal story. Right. And his career path is very unusual. And usually, like a Latham and Watkins wouldn't take on somebody uh, that's been bouncing around everywhere. Or Kirkland. Or I mean, Barnes. Three of those are 
in the top like 10 oh, yeah, yeah, in yeah, the country, right? The elite LA corporate law firms. Right. Or the elite corporate na- they're international corporate law firms, but mm-hmm. that are that are in LA. I don't mm-hmm. know if there's an Oh, Melvin he would be the only bigger one. Or only big one that's not on that list. Uh, well, I mean at the age of 32 she gets pregnant and decides to uh, go to film school at the same time. He's working full time. There's nobody at home. She gives birth and the baby I guess was raising itself while she was working on these indie films from 2012 till today. You know, all of her things are one short after another right. from 2012. Her first feature film is 2019. She's only done three features in her life. You know, but she's a rising star in the cinematography world. In making, 2012. So 2012, she's making three-minute video shorts, but she's got this right. background in England working for Dalton on these documentaries in England. So there is mm-hmm. gravitas in terms of that. I mean, she's got a stranger arc than he does. You know, the two of them right. together. Yeah. I mean, I, I've never seen a couple very, like that. Very odd arc, yes. Anyway, that's kind of what we've uncovered in the past <laughs> in the past week. I mean, we just needed manic. a normal person to explain it to us. <laughs> and it has been manic. Uh, we've been on the phone all day, swapping pictures, everything else. I mean, literally everything coming through. So, folks, I hope you enjoy this. And tell us what you think. Why don't you connect the dots? That's We're right. just laying out dots. I'm a dot We're not maker. making any claims at business. all. We're dot machines. We're dot machines. Yeah, we don't connect. <laughs> we, we make dots. We want all of you to, first off, subscribe, and second, tell us what you think. Connect the dots, because we really are not claiming anything other than, boy, this is it's, some odd information. This is some strange stuff going on here. 